Good morning, everybody. Welcome. I'm Mark Levine, Chair of the City Council's Committee on Health, joined by dedicated and stalwart Health Committee member, Council Member Alika Amprey Samuel. This is a, a busy day here at City Hall, as you no doubt noted, so we'll have folks coming in and out throughout the hearing. But I, I am just so excited about our topic today and about the legislation that we're considering. Uh, this probably isn't the biggest or most, most complicated or most expensive bill that we'll consider this term in the Health Committee, but it will have a life-changing benefit for many New Yorkers. Uh, and we're going to talk about the reasons for that and the impact, but I am really proud to be pushing this bill forward. This is intro 954, a local law which would allow individuals applying to amend the sex designation on their birth certificate to self-attest that the change in sex designation is to conform the person's legal gender to the person's gender identity. The bill would also allow individuals who don't identify as exclusively male or female to change the sex designation on their birth certificate to X. I want to start off by expressing how grateful I am to the advocacy community that has worked tirelessly and passionately to push this forward. And many of you are here today, and I know we'll hear from some of you in testimony. And I also want to acknowledge our council speaker, Corey Johnson, who uh, was my predecessor as health chair, and in that role last term um, was a champion for this policy and implemented major legislation in 2015, which we'll be talking about, which was an historic step forward towards this goal. Uh, birth certificates are vital documents that are used in many contexts to prove identity, age, and citizenship. They are often the only form of ID that low-income New Yorkers have when applying for jobs or public benefits. Birth certificates in New York are required for a number of basic and important services, including but not limited to obtaining professional certifications, obtaining driver's licenses and passports, demonstrating work eligibility, registering for school, obtaining access to public facilities, obtaining a gun permit, and obtaining access to public benefits. Without a birth certificate that accurately reflects their gender identity, transgender people are routinely forced to disclose their transgender status, resulting in increased difficulty in accessing critical services and opportunities. Moreover, without correct identification, transgender people are subject to harassment, discrimination, and accusations of fraud. According to the 2015 National Transgender Discrimination Survey, 25% of people were verbally harassed, 16% were denied services or benefits, 9% were asked to leave a location or establishment, and 2% were assaulted or attacked as a result of showing an identification with a name or gender that did not match their gender presentation. As a result of discrimination in housing, employment, education, and access to health services, transgender people are disproportionately unemployed, HIV positive, and homeless. Local Law 1, adopted by the Council in 2015, finally removed the antiquated requirement for individuals to present proof of sex reassignment surgery to amend their gender marker on their birth certificates. Local Law 1 allowed individuals to amend the gender on their birth certificates by having a medical or mental health professional fill out an affidavit or affirmation attesting that the changed sex designation more accurately reflects the applicant's gender identity. Since the passage of Local Law, Lo local law 1, more transgender individuals were able to change their sex designation on their birth certificate to reflect their gender identity. Between 2015 and between January of 2015 and March of 2017, no fewer than 731 birth certificate gender marker change applications were approved, compared to only 20 approximately per year previously. 
Local Law 2, passed in conjunction with Local Law 1, created an advisory board of transgender advocates and other experts to review and evaluate the implementation of Local Law 1. The findings and recommendations of this advocacy board instructed City Council uh, to pursue the legislation that we are hearing today, which will broaden individuals' access to birth certificates that accurately reflect their gender identity. The bill we're hearing today, Introduction 654, would allow individuals to amend the sex designation on their birth certificate without requiring the affirmation of a physician or health professional. Instead, this legislation would require a signed and notarized statement by the applicant, attesting that the request for change in sex designation is to conform to the person's, is to conform the person's legal gender to the person's gender identity. Introduction 954 would also allow the individuals who don't identify as exclusively female or male to change the sex designation on their birth certificate to X. Applicants under age 18 would be required to also include notarized statements from the parents listed on their birth record or from their legal guardian or guardians, requesting that the sex designation on the birth record be changed to female, male, or X to conform to the applicant's gender identity. A birth certificate is a critical document, and having one that correctly reflects your gender identity is a basic human right. In passing intro 954, New York City will join the ranks of jurisdictions like California and Washington states and several nations around the world which have enacted similar legislation to make it easier for individuals to ensure the gender on their birth certificate is consistent with their gender identity. I am also pleased to report that as was the case with Local Law 1, the city's Board of Health is working on a mirror provision in, uh, to amend the city's health code. Local Law 1 transformed the lives of transgender individuals in so many ways that other people take for granted from accessing government benefits and health coverage to getting a job and using appropriate facilities. With this legislation, we will make a critical, critical document even more accessible to a population that is still terribly disenfranchised today. I want to express one more time my grat gratitude to the advocacy community for their critical input and, of course, to our council speaker, Cora Johnson, on this important legislation. And we are now going to turn it over to our colleagues uh, at City Hall and in the Health Department for their opening testimony. Uh, I am uh, excited with anticipation that this will not be a contentious hearing <laughs> with the administration. Very refreshing. We love that. And I'm going to ask our committee counsel to administer the uh, affirmation. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Oh, wonderful. All you. <laughs> uh, good morning, Chair Levine, members of the Health Committee. Um, I am very excited to be here. My name is Ash McGovern, and I am the director of the NYC Unity Project the First Lady's citywide initiative to support and empower LGBTQ young people through innovative policy and program change. I am joined by Assistant Commissioner Gretchen Van Wy from the Health Department. On behalf of the administration, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. We are pleased to be here in order to emphasize our strong support for Intro 954, which will positively affect transgender people born in New York City, as well as gender non-binary and intersex people. As a trans, gender non-binary person myself, I can also personally attest to the importance of this bill. I want to specifically thank you, Chair Levine, and Speaker Johnson for your dedication to LGBTQ communities, your support of the NYC Unity Project, and your commitment to trans and gender non-conforming communities at a time when our federal government is attacking our right to exist and live freely at work, in school, in healthcare settings, and in our daily lives. As you know, the mayor and first lady have a long record of supporting and empowering trans and gender nonconforming communities. 
Just last month, the First Lady announced our unprecedented $9.5 million commitment to address the issues of LGBTQ youth homelessness, health inequity, and family rejection through the NYC Unity Project. All issues that disproportionately impact trans and gender nonconforming communities, and particularly communities of color. The mayor has also been a strident supporter of trans and gender nonconforming communities. In April, the administration announced it would become the largest city in the country to house incarcerated people according to their gender identity and not their sex assigned at birth. In June 2017, the administration public New York, published New York City's first ever LGBTQ health care bill of rights in partnership with the Department of Health. In June 2016, New York City became the first municipality to launch a citywide campaign specifically affirming the right of transgender individuals to use the bathroom consistent to their gender identity or expression. In March 2016, Mayor de Blasio issued an executive order requiring city agencies to ensure that employees and members of the public are given equal access to city single-sex facilities without being required to show identification, medical documentation, or any other form or proof of identity. And finally, in December 2015, the New York City Commission on Human Rights issued legal enforcement guidance describing specific gender identity protections under the city human rights law, including equal bathroom access, as well as access to housing, employment, public accommodations, and other important protections. If passed, this bill will enhance autonomy and self-determination for trans, gender non-binary, and intersex people. It will allow many individuals to obtain identity documents that more accurately reflect who they are, with the goal of ensuring that they can more safely move through our city, free from discrimination. By allowing individuals to self-attest to their gender identity without relying on a third-party medical provider, the city will remove one key barrier that community members currently must overcome in order to obtain an accurate birth certificate. Trans and gender non-binary people know who they are and it is unnecessary and indeed often prohibitive to require that they first get medical approval to simply amend their identity documents. By adding an X option to New York City birth certificates, our city will also create the opportunity for gender non-binary and some intersex people too, meaning individuals whose sex characteristics fall outside of our typical assumptions about male and female bodies, to have at least one identity document that more accurately reflects who they are. According to the largest national survey of transgender people in the country, conduct conducted by the National Center for Transgender Equality, nearly half of trans people identify as more than one gender or beyond the identities of male or female altogether. It is in the spirit of our shared commitment to the rights of trans, gender non-binary, and intersex people that the administration strongly supports Intro 954. This administration will continue to work with our partners at DOH and agencies across the city to ensure that trans, non-binary, and intersex people are more fully represented and considered in our city's policies and programs. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to working with you all on the city council moving forward as in my capacity as director of the NYC Unity Project. Following testimony from the health department, we will be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Director McGovern. Um, Commissioner, I believe you are planning on testifying as well. That's so correct. sorry for the formality, but we do have a rule that all members of the administration have to offer an affirmation. So we don't actually need to reread it, uh, since you can probably recall. I, but I will, yes. <laughs> OK, thank you for that. And, and uh, we look forward to hearing your testimony. Great, thank you. Good morning, um, Chairperson Levine and members of the Health Committee. Um, my name is Gretchen Van Wy, and I'm the Assistant Commissioner of the Bureau of Vital Statistics at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. On behalf of Commissioner Bassett, thank you for the opportunity to testify on Intro 954. As you know, the Health Department is currently pursuing an amendment to the New York City Health Code similar to this legislation, and we are very happy that the Council and the Administration share the common goal of continuing to remove barriers and improve the birth certificate gender marker change process for transgender and gender nonconforming individuals. We know that being able to live your authentic gender and gender expression is critical to physical and mental health. Transgender and gender nonconforming New Yorkers, like everyone else, should have birth certificates that reflect their true gender identity. Documents that accurately reflect a person's gender identity can be critical to accessing health care employment, and other important services. Currently in New York City, transgender individuals who want to change the gender marker on their birth certificate 
must obtain a letter from a physician or an affidavit by a licensed health or mental health professional attesting that the revised designation accurately reflects the individual's gender. <clears throat> this policy, which was championed by Speaker Johnson in 2014, removed the requirements for a legal name change in surgery. Since then, over 1,000 birth certificates have been amended with gender marker changes. Regarding the bill under discussion today, the administration strongly supports Intro 954. The department, in discussion with other states and advocates, has found that having practitioners affirm or attest to an applicant's gender identity is a potential barrier for persons without access to a practitioner and does not add sufficient value to the process of deciding whether a birth certificate should be issued. <clears throat> for this reason, we recommend a legislative and regulatory change to rely upon an applicant's attestation for the purpose of affirming their gender identity. Additionally, many people ad identify outside the gender binary, male or female. The department supports the legislative and regulatory proposals that will allow these individuals the option for a third gender designation of X. X is emerging as a standard for non-binary identification on legal documents, including driver's licenses. In California, Oregon, um, Washington, D.C., and Washington State all have or will soon adopt X for this purpose. If this proposal is passed, New York City would join this list of jurisdictions that are ahead of the federal government on this issue, which may create some instances where the gender marker on an individual's birth certificate does not align with available options for state and federal documents. To make the process as easy as possible for transgender and gender nonconforming applicants, the department has staff members in our Office of Vital Record Services to serve as the key point persons to help individuals navigate this process and answer any questions. In light of the importance of this change, the department will develop an outreach and education strategy to notify individuals and answer any questions about potential state or federal conflicts. The department welcomes and looks forward to collaboration with the council, the Gender Marker Change Advisory Board, and advocates as we implement this outreach strategy and work to spread the word about this important change. We wouldn't be here today without the New York City Gender Marker Change Advisory Board, co-chaired by Carrie Davis and Ethan Rice, which was created by the council in 2014. The board includes community members of transgender experience and experts in the health and legal fields and was tasked with identifying barriers and evaluating processes in order to improve the implementation of the gender marker change law. Board members advocated for the new, more streamlined process in which the city will allow self-attestation and also the option of X on birth certificates. I also want to thank Speaker Johnson for his leadership on this issue. In 2014, he was instrumental to making the first major change in New York City's transgender birth certificate procedures in over 40 years, creating the Gender Marker Advisory Board and sponsoring the legislation being discussed today. Updating the gender marker change process for transgender individuals and creating a non-binary gender marker are important steps in enabling people to attain official documents that accurately reflect their gender identity. We are proud to jointly support these updates to the administrative and health codes with the council and look forward to future collaboration as we move ahead. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. We are happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I uh, want to acknowledge we've been joined by stalwart fellow health committee member Keith Powers. Um, uh, Commissioner, can you clarify exactly how many New Yorkers have taken advantage of Local Law 1 since 2015? Absolutely. Whereas we had approved about 20 uh, gender marker change amendments per year prior to the rule, we issue th about 330 a year now. We've issued since um, the time of the enactment um, about 1,119 new birth certificates. So it's a tremendous increase. That's extraordinary. So a 15-fold increase right. so far, which we ex assume will only increase once we remove the barriers that uh, we'll be taking down with yes. today's legislation. Um, your unit, uh, uh, I believe, was uh, pretty expeditious in processing mm -hmm. the market changes, doing it in less than a work week on average um, in the wake of Local Law 1. Do you expect that you'll have systems in place uh, for the new change to continue that? That's our aim. That's okay, our excellent. Um, there is a cost of $55. Uh, for any New Yorker to um, implement a change of name or other marker on their birth certificate, correct? Right. So there is a $40 charge for a correction and it costs $15 for a new certificate to cover the operational expenses 
associated with running the unit. Is there a provision for someone who uh, is extremely low income and would not be able to pay the $55 fee? Um, unfortunately, there's not a provision on the city level, but there are some nonprofit and community-based organizations that have paid that fee for their constituents. I'll just make the point that this is such a life-changing action that a New Yorker could take that if the only thing preventing them moving forward was a $55 fee, which the city really doesn't need, that we should find a way to remove that barrier. And we'd love to work with your office uh, either through uh, city rules or through uh, securing of outside funding to make sure that cost, uh, after we've removed all these other barriers, wouldn't be a final limitation for any New Yorkers. Okay. Um, do we? Yes. Okay. I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, Keith Powers. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And I'm Sorry, I sorry, got here just a little bit late. It's a two, two, te two hearing day. Um, I thank you for the testimony and your support as well. And certainly for, I think, a lot of New Yorkers, this, uh, this and other efforts you guys have done is, is, a, is an opportunity to let people per, you know, reflect who they are and, and how they identify. Um, in terms of the beyond the identity part of it, you know, your birth certificate certainly should match you know, who you feel you are. Are there other legal or other um, uh, barriers that one faces with the birth certificate where this might be helpful? Is it, is it predominantly around identification or are there other ways that this would be as helpful or you know, assist a, a person it, by having the appropriate way that they identify on their birth certificate? So the, the birth certificate is essentially um, assisting people with their identification, you're right, so that is essentially uh, the purpose. Got it, and with, what about when, if you were getting a driver's license or a passport, would, would having the, the, uh, a, new, a new category affect that in any way? That's a great question. So we, we recognize that we're being um, on, the, on the cutting edge of being, um, leading a change here across the country. Um, so X will not be reflected in all states, DMV offices, or, nor in other documents necessarily. Um, this is something we've discussed with our advisory board, and there's a recognition that it's, um, there's a merit to making the change. It's the right thing to do. Even so, it will help build momentum for more changes around the country. Um, but that's one of the things that we wanted to help do when we roll out our communications plan around this, is let people know that. Got it. And the Board of Health, I think, was doing change. Maybe they, they did already. They knew they were, they were meeting and enacting changes to reflect this as well. I had two questions. One is status of that, and B, I think they passed it or they had a meeting recently. And second is, um, is there a reason the Board of Health, and then we need, I mean, the admin code, obviously, amending it makes it part of, our, part of our law here in New York City. Is there a reason we had to do both, or is it just a reflection of, of importance and you know, the support system behind both? I think it's probably all of the above, so it's really, it's a very important issue to us. The changes to the process and procedure in the Bureau of Vital Statistics are generally in the health code, and so um, this allows us to be nimble and be progressive. I think the importance in 2014 was to make sure that that was a durable change, um, and there was a real commitment by the council, so both were enacted. So we're following a sim similar process now. And, and it did, did, what, what's the status of the Board of Health? The status right now is that the, there was an introduction of the uh, proposal last week. Uh, there will be a public hearing in July, and there will be a vote by the Board on the actual adoption. When, um, when is in that? September. Take, September. Mm -hmm. Got it. And so we, if by theoretically passing this advance, if we did pass this in advance of Board of Health, they could still vote on it, but it would be, it, but it would be, well, I guess not unnecessary, but they would, we would already be part of the. Right. We want to have it be coordinated and um, together. Got it. Great. And then the um, last question is, do you guys have any expectations or information or predictions about how many folks will well, actually, I have two questions. When, if, if it, um, how long would it take for this to be available? Like, when would people sure. be able to opt in? And then, second is any, let's just say, in a year one, any expectation or prediction in terms of how many New Yorkers will 
take advantage of it? So the, we're, we're planning for this to go in, in place. Um, we're hoping in the beginning of next year. So January is often where we tie these changes to for a number of different reasons. Um, and we are really looking forward to finding out the answer to the question. Uh, Me about too. How That's many. why. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to we'll have to report back to you. And, on and that. I guess my last question is: as you have some, I think you have some data. You mentioned about, about a thousand people have already yes. taken it. Mm -hmm. um, would there be any information available of, of of how many of that a thousand would opt into X category? X? Would have been in. Would would have yeah. cho chosen X? Well, um, we. We don't have that. Um, we don't have that information currently. We have been conducting an evaluation of our process, and we've published on that um, in the American Journal of Public Health because we're interested in the improvements. Um, we could ask that question. It would be determined by response rate and whether or not people, you know, if we ask that question. But uh, I think we'll look prospectively and uh, report back to you on um, what the distribution is. And my Absolutely. last question, I'm sorry, I said it was the last one. This is the it's last okay. one. Um, any city or states that so far have done this, would we be the first to? There, you might Washington be in your State oh, Washington. has done this, um, California and Oregon. So we're the fourth. Uh, city, not state. We'd be the first city. Not first, state. Yeah, yeah, the first city, the fourth jurisdiction. Yeah, got mm -hmm. it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I want to acknowledge we've been joined by fellow health committee member, council member Anaz Barron. And... Um, D Director McGovern, so mm -hmm. are you uh, the administration's representative on the Gender Marker Advisory Committee, or do you interface with them at all? Uh, I haven't interfaced with the Advisory Committee, but I am here to represent the administration. But you are what? But I am here to represent the administration. Yes, a absolutely, yeah. absolutely. We, we know you've been uh, a strong leader on this issue. Um, outreach uh, is so important here. It's, mm -hmm. We have 8 million people in the city. We need, we have a lot of communication to do to let the people who this will impact um, know about this new right. Um, I presume this would be a multi-agency push um, that the health department um, may lead, but uh, would there be other agencies involved in, in communicating to the public about uh, this important change, and would the mayor's office play a role in coordinating that? Absolutely, we can connect with, through the Unity Project, we're connected to um, several city agencies, so I think this is definitely something we would want to amplify through the Unity Project and our partnerships with agencies. And does the Unity Project interface with CBOs that might yes. touch people who could directly benefit from this? Yes. And would we establish materials that we can distribute, uh, explaining the law or anything else to help people communicate this to their constituents? Yeah, I, I think, Probably it would be best to circle back with the Department of Health and have further conversation, but I think that makes a lot of sense. Yes. Great. We, we, we often assume that bills we pass here uh, resonate uh, through every member, of every person who lives in the city, but um, uh, the truth is uh, it takes a lot to get the word out, and it takes resources, it takes advertising, uh, it takes a, a deliberate communication strategy, and it would be really sad if someone who could benefit from this just didn't know that they had the, that right. So uh, we, we want to partner with you, with the mayor's office, with the health department, and all the relevant community groups uh, to make sure that every New Yorker uh, knows about this important development. So thank you both very much for your support and for your testimony today. Thank you. Thank we're we're going to move on to our next panel, uh, which will starting with A.C. Dumlau from Tildef, Carrie Davis uh, from Carrie Davis Consulting, Demona Gordon also from Lambda Legal, and Char uh, Weagle from Interact. Sorry if I mispronounced any of your names. And I should, I should acknowledge that Carrie was a key advocate on the advisory committee which helped to establish this new proposal. Okay, would you like to kick us off? All right.
It is on now. Good morning. Chairman Levine and members on the Committee on Health, thank you for convening today's hearing. My name is AC Dumlau, and I am a queer, transgender, non-binary New Yorker born just over the bridge in Kings County Hospital in Brooklyn to the name Angela Christie, where I was assigned female at birth. I work as the Name Change Project Coordinator at the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund, also known as TILDEF. TILDEF's Name Change Project connects low-income transgender and non-binary people with lawyers providing pro bono legal representation for the New York City civil court name change process. Our participants come from all walks of life, including people of color, recipients of public assistance, non-citizens, and housing insecure or houseless people. Securing a legal name change can be a challenging experience involving interaction with the court system and judges that makes it foreign and intimidating to many people, in addition to costing an average of $118 out of pocket. By providing people with adequate legal representation, including financial assistance or applying for fee waivers, helping order certified copies of one's birth certificate for the name change, and procuring certificates of disposition and more, TILDEF works to ensure that people successfully complete the process. I am proud to lead this life-changing program, but it's important for me to note that once an individual completes this process, and receives the final granted order for their name change, this is only the first step. Specifically for a non-binary individual, after changing one's name on their government IDs, which I again note can be costly, this freedom then stops. I've explained to non-binary participants that Cal- You're okay, you can continue. I'm okay. Um, that California, Oregon, and Washington have the third category on birth certificates that Washington, D.C. allows it on driver's licenses, but not yet in New York. Uh, this proposed amendment is a step in the right direction to change the world of only two genders, two choices, a world which excludes a breadth of gender-variant individuals who are living their truth in a world that has not yet made space for that, a world of resilient New Yorkers who have, waiting, who have been waiting to be seen, a first step towards true equality for all. Thank you, and my written remarks are um, submitted as well. Thank you, AC, for your eloquent statement. So, TILDEF is a national organization, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. And you may know then about um, how implementation has been on this policy in, in Washington State and California. Is there anything that New York can learn uh, from those states which are ahead of us on this? I think that it's, it's time to catch up. Um, it's pretty, as a New Yorker, it can be a little embarrassing to tell people on the phone, you know, we're, we're not doing it yet, um, and that, you know, uh, Oregon and um, Washington, D.C. has it on driver's licenses. I think it's been great that we've discussed um, once the name change is ordered and when birth certificates are updated with X, there are still driver's licenses, there are still passports, there are still public benefits cards, um, there are doctor's forms, there are so many times when MRF will still be on old documentation. And so I think this is the first step in the right direction. Um, and not to knock my, my home state, but we are behind some other states on, on this policy. Better late than never. Absolutely. All right, thank you, I see. Thank you very much. Please. Good morning. So please accept my gratitude for allowing Kimberly Smith to read my testimony in support of intro 954. I recently had knee surgery and am physically unable to attend today's hearing in person. Uh, my name is Carrie Davis. I am a health care consultant and chair of the New York City DOHMH Report and Advisory Board on Gender Marker Change Requirements. I was appointed to this committee by the City Council and also served the city as Commissioner of Human Rights. Prior to this, I was the Chief Programs and Policy Officer at New York City's Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Center, where I had worked since 1998. I've been very fortunate over these last 20 years to collaborate with the city as it has worked step by step to address the basic needs of transgender and gender non-binary New Yorkers. 
This has included working with this council to amend the law on birth certificates in 2014 and the law on human rights in 2002, working with the Commission on Human Rights to develop guidelines for that law, and working with numerous city agencies such as HRA, uh, DOC, DHS, and the NYPD, and others to better serve trans New Yorkers. And since 2004, I've worked in coalition after coalition with advocates, the DOHMH, and the City Council to allow trans people born in the city access to accurate and affirming birth records. While some trans people have a safe and healthy journey to self-sufficiency and future employment, others are placed at risk by substantial stigma and disruptions. This often cascades into lifelong difficulties with health, education, and employment. Despite the work that has been done so far, cultural stigma still labels trans people as mentally ill, deviant, fraudulent, and as predators. This forcefully clashes with our lived experiences and negatively impacts our lives at almost every turn. Only one in five trans people has an ID that matches their current identity, meaning that most are in danger of disclosure of their status every time they apply for a job or housing or interact with the police. Trans people have twice the rate of unemployment compared to the average, and nearly all report harassment or discrimination on the job or trying to hide their trans identity to avoid it. As a consequence, trans people are nearly four times more likely to have an annual income under $10,000 than the general population. All of this significantly increases the contact and associated costs trans people have with the homeless, medical, legal systems. Birth certificates are a foundational tool as we seek to address this negative cascade. The National Association of Public Health Statistics notes a birth certificate breeds all others, social security cards, school records, driver's licenses, passports, and employment records. It means citizenship. Having a birth certificate that shows the wrong gender can make doing any of those things difficult or impossible. And when trans people show a certificate with a gender other than the one they live in, they may be accused of fraud, turned away, harassed, arrested, attacked, humiliated, and discriminated against. Along with the responsibility to document births, it's the city's responsibility to document them accurately. It is in the best interest of New York and its trans citizens to have access to accurate birth records. And this duty should be, never become a barrier to anyone's active participation in our society. The proposed, the proposed legislation improves the already impressive law that we helped to revise in 2014 to allow transgender and gender non-binary people to change the sex designation on their birth record to conform to their gender identity. This includes the addition of one, a third category of X to reflect the non-binary gender identity, and gender identity, and two, transgender and gender non-binary people born in New York City will no longer need a letter from a physician or an affidavit by a licensed healthcare provider. These are positive actions that address some of the challenges faced by trans New Yorkers as they seek the same privileges and rights that others already enjoy. This legislation will help enhance social and economic opportunities for trans people born in the city and reinforce our commitment to respect and inclusion. These are not radical nor unique requests. They are instead common sense steps to bring our city in line with modern and scientific stand standards held by numerous state jurisdiction as well as other nations across the world. Council Speaker Corey Johnson has stated, now more than ever, it's important for elected officials to show our constituents that we see them we have their backs and we respect them for who they are. Let us celebrate this potent and collective vision as we take another step forward with intro 954. Thank you very much, Kimberly, and, and of course we thank Carrie as well. Thank you. Please. Good morning. My name is Demolia Gordon. I'm a staff and transgender rights project attorney at Lambda Legal. Lambda Legal is the oldest and largest national legal organization dedicated to achieving the recognition of civil rights for lesbians, gay men, bisexuals, and transgender people, and people living with HIV. My colleague, Ethan Rice, um, as you all know, um, is a co-chair of the advisory board, but could not be here today as he's traveling for work. So I'm here to present Lambda Legal's testimony in support of Intro 954. I would like to thank you, Chairman Mark Levine and the Committee on Health for the opportunity to testify strongly in support of Intro 954. If passed, this bill would build on previous improvements to the procedures for correcting sex markers on New York City birth records by allowing for self-attestation and eliminating the requirement of a health professional's affidavit. 
which is not only burdensome, but also unnecessary and harmful. Intro 954 would also provide the option of a sex designation that is not exclusively male or female, indicated by an X. Self-attestation is good policy and is already used on state IDs for information such as height, weight, hair color, and eye color. Requiring a healthcare provider to confirm a person's gender is belittling, expensive, and is no more necessary than it is for these other characteristics. The National Association of Social Workers, the American Psychological Association, and the World Professional Association for Transgender Health all support self-attestation. This change will reduce the burdens placed upon transgender, non-binary, and intersex people when trying to obtain accurate and affirming birth records. Burdens that are even heavier for members of our communities who are of color or who, are, who have low or no income. Lack of access to accurate identity documents is harmful. According to the 2015 U.S. Transgender Survey, 67% of respondents did not have an ID or record that reflected their gender identity, with 88% of non-binary people reporting that the options available did not fit their identity. Presenting an inaccurate identity document that is inconsistent with one's gender identity often triggers prejudice, violence, discrimination, harassment, and invasions of privacy. This is why Lambda Legal works throughout the country to secure access to accurate identity documents for all. With recent court victories in Puerto Rico and Idaho and a pending lawsuit challenging Ohio's refusal to allow transgender people to update the sex marker on their birth certificates. With the passage of Intro 954, New York City would join other jurisdictions, some of which have been mentioned, but I also want to note that New Jersey also is on the cusp of doing this, um, and there's a bill that just passed that is awaiting the governor's signature, so we definitely want to do this here. <laughs> um, would join other jurisdictions at the forefront of removing harmful and unnecessary barriers to accurate and affirming identity documents, including providing an option to designate one sex as neither male nor female. Binary only gender marker policies fail to account for the existence of members of our communities with non-binary identities. Withholding accurate identity documents from non-binary people is also arbitrary and capricious, as demonstrated by the 2016 court decision issued in favor of Lambda Legal's client, Dana Zim, who seeks an accurate passport reflecting their identity as an intersex non-binary person. While Lambda Legal applauds this vital step towards human rights and dignity for all New Yorkers, we have a couple of suggestions for the council's consideration. First, we suggest changing the requirement of notarized statements from both parents or legal guardian of a minor to require a notarized statement from just one parent or legal guardian. This would allow for greater access to accurate birth certificates for young people, including in cases where one parent may be unavailable, unwilling, or unable to provide a notarized statement. Second, the correction of a birth record, as has been noted before, may cost $55 to $57 or more. This cost may be prohibitive for many who would benefit from this legislation. Data shows that transgender and non-binary New Yorkers experience higher rates of discrimination, unemployment, and poverty. According to the 2015 U.S. Transgender Survey, 24% of transgender New Yorkers who have not updated the gender on their identity documents report that they didn't do so due to financial inability. These burdens are even greater for transgender and non-binary people of color. Thus, we urge the council to explore fee waivers or other financial assistance op options to ensure that all who need to correct their birth records could do so. For these reasons, I urge you to pass intro 954 with Lambda Legal suggested amendments. Please do not hesitate to contact me should you have any questions or need additional information, or you could ask me now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and for your suggestions, which we will certainly uh, look at. And um, thank you for the alert that we're racing to beat New Jersey. Nothing motivates New Yorkers <laughs> like a contest with I New Jersey. So. <laughs> we're going to have to speed this up for sure. Thank you. Good morning. And uh, thank you, Chairman Levine and members of the Committee on Health. My name is Shar Weigel. And I come before you as the mother of Alicia Weigel, uh, a Cornell graduate, successful in her career, a former actor and former model. 
And why do I mention modeling? Because if my daughter walked into the room today, you would say she is a beautiful woman, and she is, and Alicia is also intersex. When my husband was driving me to the hospital for her birth 28 years ago, we finally settled on the name of Charles because it was my husband's name and the name of both of our fathers. And at the end of my labor, my OB said, congratulations on your baby daughter. I couldn't see a thing at my end of the table, and I, but I said, no, it's a boy. And someone said, you wanted a boy, but you will love this little girl. And I said, no, you don't understand. I had an amniocentesis. It's a boy. And my husband spoke up quietly from the corner in the room, and he said, I've always liked the name Alicia. It was the name of that hurricane when we moved to Houston. And so I became the mother of an extraordinary daughter. The doctors at Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania helped us understand that Alicia had complete androgen insensitivity. And if you've heard of that, I applaud you. I'm a nurse, and I had never heard of it. It means that while Alicia appears female, she is genotypically male with XY chromosomes. I passed on to her a genetic code that did not respond to androgen hormones that would have developed her male, her male organs early in my pregnancy. Alicia looked like a girl, so someone on the medical team wrote the word female in her medical record. Other children with different genetic conditions are born with unclear or mixed genitalia. A medical professional in the delivery room makes a split-second call about whether the word male or female works its way onto a birth certificate. One small word that does not define, but can confine someone for the rest of their life. When Alicia was born, the medical profession was silent on intersex. We had a wonderful doctor who advised us to the best of his knowledge at the time, but never once did he suggest that we keep an option open for Alicia to tell us who she was. He relied on the best science at the time, but a science based on a very small sample size. Intersex conditions were on the down low, in the shadows. It was hard to distinguish where science ended and bias began. 30 years later, we have better science. We know that 1.7% of the world's population, 5.5 million Americans, are intersex. And then additional Americans are transgender or chimera or gender nonconforming. My point is that we have progressed to where we should allow our friends, neighbors, children, every person, the right to identify themselves rather than rely on the snap judgment of a nurse or doctor in the chaos of the delivery room. I applaud Council Speaker Corey Johnson for sponsoring this law to amend sex de designation on birth records and the First Lady for her support and each of you for your work in this hearing. The bill brings the reality of legal documents into alignment with reality. My daughter should be able to define who she is rather than I or a person who assisted at her birth. Really, who cares how I would define her gender? It's her right to define herself. In a way, this bill would be nothing. And by nothing, I mean it would simply allow a person to say who they are. No one else can say that for them. That should be a given, a nothing in society. I urge you to pass this bill that will cost you nothing, but will return agency, identity, and the right to be who you are to thousands of New Yorkers. Thank you so much for listening to my testimony and your work to support unity and inclusiveness in New York City. Thank you for that very, very powerful statement. Your daughter sounds like an incredible person. She is. And she was born not in New York City? You said in upstate New York? She was born, she was born in Philadelphia. Got it. But the situation so we're, we're going to have to work with uh, Lambda and TILDEF to uh, launch a campaign in Pennsylvania. I think Mayor Kenya would be on board with that. <laughs> um, and you are connected to a group called Interact, yes. is that right? Yes, that's my daughter is very active in Interact, and I'm one of the volunteers in and, support. And, and this is a national advocacy organization? For intersex individuals. Okay. Thank you again for your testimony. A, a wonderful panel. Thank you, all of you. Okay, next up we have Freddie Molano from Community Healthcare Network, Nala Simone Toussaint 
from Callan Lord Community Health Center, Charlie Arrowwood from Transcend Legal, and Alejandra Caravaggio from New York Legal Assistance Group, AKA NILAG. Okay, please. Is your mic on? Now it's on. Okay. Good morning, and thank you, Chairman Levine, and members of the committee, for the opportunity to speak this morning. I am Freddy Molano, and I'm the Vice President of uh, Infectious Diseases and LGTB Programs at Community Health Care Network. CHN is a non for profit network of 13 federal qualified health centers including two school-based health centers and a fleet of medical mobile vans. We provide a high-quality primary care, dental, behavioral health, and social services to over 85,000 New Yorkers in Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx, and we turn no one away. For 15 years, CHN has been providing affirming health care services to transgender and gender nonconforming individuals throughout New York City. We serve about 500 transgender patients every year through our network-wide transgender family program and our sexual behavioral health programs in Jamaica, Queens, and the Lower East Side in Manhattan. Our mission is grounded on the behalf of that all individuals have the right to comprehensive and cultural responsive care. As part of this mission is our duty to advocate for the rights and well-being of CHN's patients. This includes the right to express one gender freely and without consequence. New York City has taken important steps in preserving this right through a number of policies, such as the New York City Human Rights Law, the Department of Education Transgender Students Guidelines, and the Single Sex Violence Mandate. Still, Many transgender individuals come to experience day-to-day -day challenges with stigma, discrimination, and access to care. In particular, discrepancies between sex designation and gender identity and exacerbated efforts in navigating critical services, leaving many individuals without amenities such as housing and health care. At CHN, we frequently encounter patients whose medical claims are denied because their insurance company does not believe that the resident services match the services documented sex, the patient's documented sex. Similarly, we know that transgender and gender nonconforming individuals is, experience frustration when applying for a driver's license and other forms of ID because these documents do not accurately reflect their gender identity. Today, we stand in support of the proposal which will add a third sex designation to New York City birth certificates and will allow transgender adults to provide their own affidavit for gender marker changes. We believe that this legislation will expedite the process for aligning legal and live identities and result in both psychological and practical benefits. By removing barriers of identification, the city is taking important steps toward ensuring the health and well-being of transgender communities. As a healthcare provider, we are hopeful that the elimination of such barriers will lead to better engagement in care and in improved health outcomes among transgender patients. We applaud the city's effort to validate and empower individuals of transgender uh, uh, transgender and gender nonconforming experience, and we are committed to working with the city council and the administration to further these goals. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much, Freddie. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, Chair Levine, and members of the New York City Council Health Committee for the opportunity to testify in support of intro, intro 954 
the proposal to amend the administrative code in relation to sex designation on the birth certificate, on birth records. My name is Nala Simone Toussaint and I am representing Collinor Community Health Center. Collinor Community Health Center is a growing community health center with a mission to reach lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community and people living with HIV in New York City and beyond. In 2017, Collinor provided a patient-centered medical home for nearly 18 thousand patients, more than 4,000 of whom identify as transgender or gender non-binary, non which will I abbreviate in the later as TGNB. Uh, so at Common Law, we believe true liberation will only come when LGBTQ community and our families can adequately access cultural competent and comprehensive health care in all forms. For this reason, Common Law fully supports intro 954 and amendment to the administrative code in relation to sex designation on birth records. I speak as a woman of trans experience and in my role as a transgender health advocacy coordinator at Colin Lord. And intro 954, if implemented, will improve individual and community health and as well as save lives. First, Colin Lord supports the addition of a new third category of X to reflect a non-binary gender identity. Secondly, Colin Lord endorses the proposal whereby transgender people born in New York City will no longer need a letter from a physician or an affidavit by a licensed health care provider to change their gender marker and will instead be able to submit their own affidavit which attests that the gender marker change is for the purpose of affirming their gender identity. Finally, Colin Lord believes that intro 954 will advance health equity for transgender individuals in New York City if adopted. Health uh, uh, equity exists when people have the opportunity to achieve their full health potential regardless of color of their skin, their birthplace, their level of education, their gender identity, and where they live. Having a birth certificate that aligns with that gender of a per person's lived experience will vastly open up these opportunities to score of uh, TGMB people. I like to share a uh, uh, a story of a patient who was 49 years old and a woman of trans experience who had been a patient at Colin Lord since 2004. Uh, when we started working with her in our care coordination department in 2011, she came to us needing assistance with her name change and the correction to her gender that appeared on her IDs. She was a recipient of Medicaid and SNAP benefits and she experienced continuous discrimination when she applied for housing and employment opportunities. Her health access was also limited because at the time, people were unable to change their gender um, that appeared on their benefits card at the HRA or on New York City birth certificates without showing proof of surgery, and transgender surgery was unavailable at the time. This left her essentially stranded with regards to her quality of life. As the laws across the state has changed over the years, we have been able to witness her begin to advocate for herself and her health. With time, her housing situations improved. As things began to stabilize in her life, her ability to move forward with her dream to become a chef became a reality. It was her ability to correct the IDs she had to match her gender expression that truly gave her the agency to actually fulfill her dreams. And the expansion of her gender identity to include X on a New York City birth certificate will also help the lives for those who are gender non-conforming and non-binary. Thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you for that very vivid illustration of the fact that this is not just about symbolism. There's actually very practical impacts mm -hmm. on having an accurate birth certificate, uh, health care uh, being perhaps the most dramatic. So that was uh, really a, an important contribution to the discussion. Thank you. Please. Thank you, Chairperson Levine, Speaker Johnson, the Health Committee, and the City Council for the opportunity to uh, speak to the proposed amendments regarding sex designation changes for the New York City birth certificates. My name is Charlie Arrowwood. I'm the Director of Name and Gender Recognition at Transcend Legal. 
Uh, Transcend Legal is a New York City-based nonprofit that uh, cultivates equitable social, medical, and legal recognition of transgender people by offering culturally competent transgender-led legal representation, public policy advocacy, and community education. One of our areas of service is assisting with name and gender marker changes for New York residents, many of whom were born in New York City. The city already recognizes that the current practice of assigning male or female sex at birth based on genitals is inaccurate for a known segment of the population, namely transgender, non-binary, and intersex individuals. Given that the unequal system is in place, the mechanism to correct birth certificates for these individuals needs to be seamless in order to ensure that all New Yorkers have access to accurate identity documents on a fair and equitable basis. Requiring provider let letters is an unnecessary burden in this process. We also encounter a large number of people who do not feel that the currently available male or female designations accurately re represent them. I myself am non-binary and was born in New York City. I'm not currently able to get the birth certificate that accurately reflects my gender. The current policy requires applicants and their providers to effectively lie under penalty of perjury about their identity. Not only do non-binary people not have, uh, they have to find a trans-friendly provider, but they also have to find someone who's non-binary friendly, who's willing to basically acknowledge that what they're saying is untrue, but it's in the best interest of their patient. Um, so does an M designation accurately reflect my identity? No, but it's better than an F for my everyday life and my safety for me to be able to flash a document that says M than F. Um, some might argue that it kind of destroys the privacy arguments that trans advocates make. Um, if you have an X designation on your documents, but it's still my decision about when I want to disclose that. And so if I have an X designation, I'm saying this is how I want to represent myself, and I'm making the decision to show this to someone um, because that is the appropriate designation. Um, I'm going to be honest. When I found out that this proposal was coming up, I cried. It, I encounter clients all the time. Like AC mentioned, um, one of the most common questions I get is, is this available in New York? And it's frankly embarrassing and upsetting to have to explain to people that we're working on it, I'm waiting for it too. Um, and so this is a, a huge deal for a lot of people. Um, on behalf of myself, my clients, my community, thank you for considering this proposal and for listening to all of the advocates. My goodness, thank you, Charlie, for that very, very eloquent testimony and for sharing your personal story, which is uh, so helpful. Um, your professional portfolio is national, is that right? Our health insurance work is national. Our name and gender marker work is New York State. Got it. Uh, New York State. Yes. So is there a movement afoot either in other jurisdictions of the state or at the state uh, legislative level? Uh, I believe there are several different proposals in Albany um, on this, but nothing is really gaining traction at the moment. There are, I'm, I'm not positive what the exact proposals are, but I think there are two different ones. Nothing is easy in Albany, I'm afraid, but um, with New York making this move, uh, I think it, it could prove to the broader state uh, this is a, a wise and... Um, uh, judicious step to take on behalf of New Yorkers, and, and, and we appreciate your voice here. And I want to acknowledge we've been joined by fellow Health Committee member, Dr. Matthew Eugene. Thank you. And I'll uh, we'll move on to our next panelist. Thank you. Uh, Chair Levine, council members and staff, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to speak about Intro 954, which would allow individuals to change the sex designation on their birth certificates to match their gender identities. My name is Alejandra Caraballo, and I am a staff attorney at the LGBTQ Law Project at the New York Legal Assistance Group, also known as NILAG, a nonprofit law office dedicated to providing free legal services and civil ma law matters to low-income New Yorkers. NILAG serves immigrants, seniors, veterans, the homebound families facing foreclosure, renters facing eviction, low-income consumers, those in need of government assistance, children in need of special education, domestic violence victims, people with disabilities, patients with chronic illness or disease, low-wage workers, low-income low income members of the commu LGBTQ community, Holocaust survivors, as well as others in need of free legal services. 
The LGBTQ Law Project of NILAC submits this testimony in support of proposed legislation seeking to update New York City's policy regarding gender markers on birth records. Our project provides free legal services and advocacy to low-income, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer communities throughout New York City. We work to defend and expand the rights of New York City's LGBTQ community and offer legal advice and representation in a wide variety of poverty-related civil legal matters such as employment and housing discrimination, public assistance, immigration, name and gender marker changes, and family law. In 2017, NILAG represented 218 transgender and gender non-conforming clients in a variety of these areas of law, including many clients who identify as non-binary and intersex. On behalf of New York Legal Assistance Group, I am here to offer our strong support for the proposed bill to amend the administrative code in relation to amending sex designation on birth records. The importance of identity documents to TGNC, non-binary, and intersex people cannot be overstated. In addition to validating the identities of TGNC, non-binary, and intersex people, having corrected and appropriate identity documents that affirms our gender identities is vital to our health and safety. Having to present incorrect identity documents exposes TGNC people to humiliation, harassment, and violence. This proposal will protect vulnerable TGNC New Yorkers by ensuring all people have access to government documents that reflect their true identities. The proposal to add a gen third gender marker option outside the male-female binary is essential to ensure that all people in New York City are properly represented by their vital documents. For non-binary, intersex, transgender, and gender non-conforming people who do not exist within the male-female binary, the current gender markers available on birth certificates are insufficient and denigrate their identities. The X marker option is a welcome advancement that allows New Yorkers whose gender identity falls outside of the gender binary and traditional gender norms to have an accurate government document that reflects and affirms their gender identity. This is an important step in allowing people to express their authentic selves. While we welcome this proposal, we believe further changes may be necessary in the future to ensure that all New Yorkers have access to accurate identity documents. X may not accurately reflect the identities of all non-binary non people. Some New Yorkers may want to leave the gender designation blank instead, and intersex people may prefer to have a birth certificate that says I for intersex as opposed to X. We would encourage the council to listen and continue taking input from the affected TGNC New Yorkers and adopt future changes to the law that would best reflect all identities. The City Council has made great progress in adjusting the needs of transgender and gender nonconforming New Yorkers in recent years. The 2014 City Council vote to remove the restrictive surgery requirement for amending gender markers on NYC issued birth certificates was a huge step forward. But the current requirements still present tremendous barriers for low-income TGNC New Yorkers like our clients. Many TGNC people do not have access to medical providers who can provide a notarized letter attesting to their gender identity. This means they cannot obtain a birth certificate that accurately reflects who they truly are. Requiring medical documentation to obtain an accurate birth certificate is also stigmatizing and an invasion of privacy. At NILAG, we have personally seen the effects of this confusing and difficult process firsthand with our TGNC clients. The current proposal allows applicants to self-attest their identity by notarized affidavit will greatly streamline the process of amending birth certificates for all TGNC people and will also allow non-binary and intersex people to obtain an amended birth certificate that affirms and matches their gender identity. This restores autonomy and self-determination to TGNC people by allowing them the self-determination to attest their own gender identity without significant barriers such as lack of access to appropriate and affirming medical care to interfere with their ability to amend their birth certificates. People under the age of 18 are frequently required to present their birth certificates for school enrollment, after school activities, sports, and anything related to age eligibility. For young people who do not fit within the male female gender binary or whose birth certificate contains the wrong gender marker, having to produce an incorrect document is humiliating and potentially dangerous. Simply showing their birth certificate will out them, misrepresenting who they are at best and exposing them to violence or abuse at worst. The young people must be afforded the same access to similarly situated adults. While empowering parents to provide a notarized statement for their children is a step forward, we are concerned that the requirement of a statement from both parents listed on the birth certificate or a legal guardian is too restrictive. Many young TGNC people experience rejection from their families of origin. Indeed, 40% of homeless youth in New York City are LGBTQ identified. 
As such, there are likely many young people who will not get, be able to get both parents listed on their birth certificate to sign a notarized statement. The current proposal only appears to allow children with a legal guardian to avoid getting statements from their birth parents. But there are many children who are in contact with only one of their parents or estranged from both and who do not have an adult who has legal guardianship over them. There must be additional safeguards for, in place for these minors. We would suggest that the proposal be amended to allow minors to obtain an amended birth certificate upon a submission of a notarized statement from either, the child, either of the child's parents, a legal guardian, or a social worker, or case manager working with the child. I would also like to second Chair Levine's point and strongly urge the City Council to look into providing fee waivers to birth certificate amendment fees. These fees pose a significant financial barrier to many of our low-income clients and has been a substantial issue in the past um, and has affected our clients in ways that they are not able to uh, get updated and amended birth certificates. Uh, New York City has been long been on the forefront of civil rights for the LGBTQ community. A special thank you to Speaker Johnson for spearheading this bill. This proposal will ensure that all New Yorkers can access identity documents that reflect who they truly are. It is a step forward towards ensuring all people in the city are treated with dignity and respect. Thank you, Alejandra, for your testimony. And every one of the recommendations you make uh, will definitely seriously consider. And um, I want to say how important the work of NILAG is uh, for LGBT and, and GNC New Yorkers, but also uh, low-income people and people in need more broadly. Um, and it's great to have your voice in this debate. Thank you for another great panel. And now we move on. Um, the next panel is going to have a very hard act to follow, but I'm sure you can do it. Uh, Jose Abrigo from Legal Services NYC. Allison Rivard, also from Legal Services NYC. Donna Levinson from uh, Tildeth, as well as Dolph Goldenberg, also from Tildeth. Welcome. Hi. Would you like to start Thank us you. off? Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jose Abrigo, and I'm here with my colleague, Allison Rivard. Uh, we're with the LGBTQ HIV Advocacy Project at Legal Services NYC. So. Good morning. Uh, legal Services NYC is the largest civil legal services provider in New York City in the nation. LSNYC's LGBTQ HIV Advocacy Project is the largest provider of direct civil legal services to New York City's LGBTQ communities. Since the 1980s, LSNYC has served thousands of people across a variety of legal issues and has worked tirelessly on behalf of LGBTQ and HIV positive low income New Yorkers. LSNYC has an LGBTQ unit presence in all five boroughs with over a dozen staff and serves hundreds of clients every year. A critical service we offer is name changes and assistance in changing identity documents. Since 2013, LSNYC has represented 129 individuals in name changes cases and many more in identification documents cases. We have also taught continuing legal education classes, training advocates on how to represent clients in name change courts and identification documentation issues, including changing the gender markers on birth certificates, social security cards, and passports. Our organization handles one of the highest volumes of identification identity documentation cases in New York City. The amendments to section 17-167-1A of the New York City Administrative Code allows a third gender option for individuals and serve to make birth certificates more accessible for our gender non-conforming and non-binary clients by honoring their self-determination and being more representative of their identity. In 2017 alone, LSNYC has met with 57 New Yorkers who prefer gender neutral pronouns or neither identify as male or female. By allowing a third gender option for birth certificates, New York City will be at the forefront of recognizing the non-binary nature of sex and gender and being completely inclusive of all individuals. Uh, the amendments to section 17-1671C that allows notarized self-attestation in place of medical attestation is also extremely important as it removes systemic barriers that prevents many individuals from changing their gender markers. 
Removing the medical attestation requirement will make it easier for low-income TGNC individuals to change their birth certificates. Many transgender and gender nonconforming individuals often cannot afford regular health care. In 2017, a study found that 17% of New York State transgender re uh, respondents were unable to obtain health insurance. Accord accordingly, a substantial portion of the TGNC population can never obtain the medical ne attestation necessary to change the gender markers on their birth certificates. Um, even those who face health care, who are able to obtain health care, face numerous systemic barriers. Uh, we currently have a legal medical partnership with Cal and Lord, and unfortunately, not all medical providers are as awesome as they are. A recent study from LSNYC that focused on New York City, where we surveyed hundreds of LGBTQ participants and CBOs, found that nearly a quarter of survey respondents report that they have encountered problems with medical providers in the last year. A further 15% of our study participants have been treated with hostility or asked inappropriate questions by their medical providers because they are LGBT. Many TGNC individuals simply do not have affirming medical providers. By allowing self-attestation, many systemic barriers will be eliminated and the lives of TGNC individuals will be radically improved. Allowing birth certificate amendments to be more accessible through self-attestation will also lessen discrimination individuals face. A recent study of transgender and gender nonconforming individuals found that 40% of respondents are harassed when their IDs indicate a gender marker that does not match their gender identity. A client I recently helped who I asked if I could share her story agreed and I'm really grateful to her. Um, she was discriminated against because the gender marker on her electronic benefits card did not match her gender identity. As a result, while trying to purchase food, she was harassed by the store clerk, and this triggered pre-existing um, anxiety surrounding her gender dysphoria, and as a result, she did not purchase food for a week. She told LSNYC that the experience re-traumatized the abuse that she suffered, and she had to build up the courage again in order to leave her apartment. LSNYC was able to help her change her gender marker on her New York State ID and her electronic benefits card, giving her peace of mind and helping her able to navigate the world better. As numerous studies have established, LGB individuals and especially TGNC individuals are disproportionately affected by poverty. LSNYC's study found that 62% of LGBT New Yorkers had difficulty paying for a basic need in the last year, and 26% of transgender respondents face employment discrimination and income instability. For individuals who face multiple layers of discrimination, the issue of poverty is gravely compounded. The proposed amendments will help reduce discrimination and to help alleviate poverty for TGNC New Yorkers. Thank you for inviting us to testify and allowing New York City to lead the nation in transgender and gender nonconforming equality. Thank you for that powerful anecdote. And did you share the name of, of the individual? It's okay if you didn't, but I didn't catch it. I, I, she didn't give me permission to share That's fine, anything. that's yeah. fine. But uh, let her know that we appreciate her sharing that real life experience. Once again, to remind people this is about a lot more than symbolism, although that, I think that, that matters as well. There are implications even affecting access to food, it sounds like. Um, so, and, and thank you for the work, work that your organization does. You've been a great partner to my office on, on many, many fronts. Thank you. Okay, now we go to Tildef. Good morning, Chairperson Levine and other council members. Thank you for convening today's hearing. My name is Donna Levinson, and I am Senior Staff Attorney at the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund or TILDEF. I'm here with two of my colleagues to provide testimony in support of Introduction 954. Uh, we want to emphasize at the outset that, of course, we strongly favored the enactment of the New York City birth certificate law presently in effect, which was enacted in January 2015 and which, among other things, eliminated the previous extraordinarily burdensome and intrusive requirement of presenting detailed proof of so-called convertive surgery as a prerequisite to changing the sex designation on a birth certificate. However, we believe that both aspects of the proposed new legislation being considered today represent an improvement over the status quo as reflected in the 2015 legislation. They will make the New York City birth certificate correction law more inclusive of all transgender and non-binary people 
and will materially improve and facilitate the ability of people belonging to one of New York City's most vulnerable and marginalized populations to live their lives as themselves on both a symbolic and practical level. My colleague, A.C. Dum Lau, who is non-binary themselves, has already testified to the importance of making a non-binary sex designation available on New York City birth certificates. My own focus is on the move to a self-attestation procedure to replace the requirement of a health care provider's affidavit. And in a historical sense, on the remarkable progress that this proposed change would represent for transgender people over a relatively short period of time. Although I almost never comment publicly on my own history, I think it's relevant here to explain that I transitioned in 2005 while working as an attorney at a medium-sized New York City law firm, and so far as I know, was either the first or at most the second attorney ever to transition at a New York City law firm, at least without being promptly fired after doing so. At that time, only 13 years ago, New York City was one of only four or five jurisdictions in the entire United States that did not permit transgender people to change the sex designation on their birth certificates from male to female or female to male under any circumstances, even after convertive surgery. At that time, pursuant to provisions of the New York City Health Code enacted in 1971, the only option available after extensive documentation of such convertive surgery was to change the sex designation from male or female to a blank. In other words, omitting any reference to gender at all and making the person in question, in effect, officially and entirely non-gendered. Perhaps needless to say, such a change, while it would have been wonderful to have as a non-binary option alongside changing the designation to M or F, as in the proposed legislation now being considered, was as a mandatory designation worse than useless to most transgender people. Not only symbolically, given the department's refusal to acknowledge people's actual gender identity, but on a practical level, because such a mandatory blank birth certificate, which revealed on its face that it had been amended and that the person holding it was transgender, was completely unusable as proof of gender or to obtain other identification documents. We've come a long way since 2005, but we believe that the City Council now has the opportunity to do even better by enacting the proposed legislation under consideration today to provide for self-attestation and a non-binary option, thereby joining California, California, Oregon, and Washington State, as well as New Jersey, if, as we hope the new birth certificate legislation enacted in January of this year is signed by New Jersey's new governor at the forefront of recognizing the rights of transgender people to live their lives as themselves. Certainly, this would be a far cry from the situation I and other trans people faced in 2005, only 13 years ago. Now, very briefly, why do we believe that self-attestation is preferable to the presently required health care provider's attestation? First, moving towards self-attestation would remove the last vestiges of the Department of Health's previous history of bureaucratic overreaching towards and fundamental mistrust of transgender people, a history detailed in my written testimony which quotes verbatim some of the extraordinarily hostile and negative language towards transgender people used by the department in the past to justify its intransigence in refusing to correct birth certificates. Obviously, we're very happy to see that attitude change. In any event, nobody knows better than an individual transgender or gender nonconforming person what their gender identity is or is more expert on their own gender identity. Anything a doctor or other healthcare provider knows about a person's gender identity is based on what that person told them. And that person is every bit as competent to attest to their identity themselves, if not more so, as any third person can be. 
whether that person is a doctor, a social worker, a mental health counselor, or engaged in any of the other professions listed as qualifying for the presently required attestation. I have personally known who I am since I was a small child. I know my own gender identity better than anyone else, and so do, does every other transgender and non-binary person. It should not be necessary for me or any other transgender person to find a health care provider to attest to their gender identity any more than it's necessary for anyone to provide third-party confirmation of their height, weight, hair color, eye color, need for corrective lenses, or other personal information reported in any other identification document. Second, we recognize that the list of types of health care providers eligible under current law to provide the necessary attestation confirming an applicant's gender identity was intended to be broad enough so that obtaining the attestation would not be highly burdensome. Coincidentally, I submitted my own birth certificate correction application about six weeks ago, and I had no problem getting my longtime physician at Cal and Lord to sign the required attestation. But there are many transgender and non-binary people, and TILDEF has had many as clients, who simply do not have access to or cannot afford to consult or are, or are too fearful of rejection and ridicule to consult any such health care provider, either sufficiently for the provider to provide the required attestation or at all. As a practical matter, the requirement of a health care provider's attestation operates all too often as yet another unnecessary barrier to transgender people's ability to obtain legal recognition of their identities. And in that regard, I would note that TILDEF strongly supports the concept others have mentioned of making fee waivers available for those who cannot afford the present $55 fee for correcting a birth certificate. I'd like to close with a quotation from a very recent federal district court decision in Puerto Rico in which the court confirmed the constitutional right of transgender people to change the sex designation on their birth certificates. The case is Gonzalez for Navar versus Navarez in the District of Puerto Rico in a decision issued April 20th, 2018, slip op at 16. The right to identify our own existence lies at the heart of one's humanity, and so we must heed their voices the woman that I am, the man that I am. Plaintiffs know they are not fodder for memoranda legalese. They have stepped up for those whose voices, debilita debilitated by raw discrimination, have been hushed into silence. They cannot wait for another generation hoping for a lawmaker to act. Here, the city council has the opportunity to act as lawmakers to further the rights of transgender and non-binary people to identify their own existence in accordance with this proposed legislation without waiting for courts to take action. And TILDEF strongly urges the council to do so. Thank you. My goodness, that was an incredible statement. Thank you so much for delivering that. I think you gave us a written copy as well, I hope. Yes, I did. And it has all sorts of other stuff in it, including quotations from the not so wonderful language that the Department of Health uh, used to oppose the rights of transgender people in the law that was in effect until 2006. Well, you know, I'll remind folks that um, we're being live streamed now and that the video is archived online and that a transcript is repaired, prepared of, of the testimony as well as your written uh, submission. So I think that this conversation today is going to be an important record on why this city is moving forward on this. And, and uh, your voice and the voices of the other panelists have just been uh, invaluable in, in making this case to, to New Yorkers about why we're acting today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, Chairperson Levine. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Dolph Goldenberg, and I have the honor of being the Interim Executive Director at the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund, as we all now know, and formerly known as TILDEF. I also have the challenging task of 
not repeating what my colleagues, Donna Levinson and A.C. Dumlau, have already testified, but adding to it. So to say the least, I will be brief. Dr. King said that the arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And this is one more step toward justice. As others have pointed out today, birth certificates are gateway documents that help us prove citizenship and also obtain all other forms of identification. What this means for New Yorkers living or traveling outside of New York, especially in states that may have laws that are hostile to people who are transgender and non-binary, is this offers protections to them as well. And that makes this a very powerful step toward justice. The current requirements, as others have pointed out, not only discourage people who are transgender or gender non-binary from correcting this vital document, but also present an unfair burden to people who are disproportionately likely to be low income and face health care discrimination. As TILDEF has already shared, and I also firmly believe, we strongly support a gender non-binary option for birth certificates that is neither male nor female. Part of what I want to point out is that birth certificates not only are the gateway document, but they also are the foundation on which all other documents that you fill out for the rest of your life are based on. So if there's a gender non-binary option, that means intake forms will have to have it, that means application forms will have to have it, and data collection efforts will have to have it going forward in the future. So this change helps set policy at organizations and governments, not just in New York, but all over the country. We would also encourage the Department of Health to update the website materials swiftly and thoroughly if this change is made. The current DOH website has both the current rules for changing one's gender marker and also the outdated NYC code. And we can provide the link where that code currently exists. But if someone goes to that website and they see contradictory information, it becomes confusing and it discourages them from actually pursuing the change of their gender marker. I do not, however, want to end on that cautionary note. Instead, I want to again applaud the City of New York for considering this additional step toward justice and equality. Thank you. Thank you, Dolph, and thank you to Tildef, and, and you succeeded in not being repetitive at all. Uh, we appreciate your contribution, and thank you for yet another incredible panel. Thank you very much. And now we move on to Sasha Alexander from the Sylvia Sylvia Rivera Law Project, and Christina Powell from the Girls for Gender Equity uh, Organization. And this is our final panel, so no pressure, guys, but we're, we're, we're planning on going out on top here. Please. Just press the button. Thank you, I appreciate that. So I wanna thank the council members and the committee for their time and support of Intro 954. My name is Sasha Alexander. I am the director of membership at the Sylvia Rivera Law Project here in New York City. I am also a non-binary person who lives here in the city. For 16 years, SRLP has provided direct legal services and movement building support to low-income, transgender, non-conforming, and intersex folks, primarily folks of color, immigrants, undocumented folks, people living with HIV, formerly and currently incarcerated people. Uh, we have a long history of working with the city council and with city agencies to create more affirming policies for trans and gender non-conforming and intersex folks, such as working with HRA or DHS around policies for access and placement based on gender. I wanna take a little bit of time to just talk about some of the nuances that are coming up because we actually have a weekly movement building team meeting where low income, trans and gender non-conforming and intersex folks meet and last night this came up and there were a lot of questions for many TGNC people who are impacted by identity documents. So for example, I wanna bring up 
already for trans and gender non-conforming people or trans people who identify as trans women or trans men, there are a lot of issues with their identities being affirmed even after changing legal documentation. We had one member who was expressing after being arrested that since his documentation was changed, no one believed that he was trans and it took a medical examiner in the police department to, they asked him to prove he was trans in really um, uncomfortable ways. We had another member who was a trans woman of color who was misgendered and misnamed at a hospital even though her name and her gender marker were changed. And another member who shared being shamed at a store when going to purchase something uh, because her ID did not match the way she looked. So there are all sorts of nuances whether people change their IDs or not. And I think I just want to reiterate how important education is, not just um, this intro, and to ask or implore you all to provide training and evaluation around this. Um, there are some concerns about barriers that folks have to accessing this, and we're happy to hear that y'all are looking into possibly waiving funds, um, and we want to reiterate the importance for young people to be able to have access to this, to self-determine their gender identities. Um, there are some concerns around the implementation by city agencies. While we are very excited about this, we know as TGNC people and working with TGNC people that that doesn't mean that everyone gets the memo. And so we hope that in making this, uh, introducing this, that the that elected officials will work closer with our communities around some of the nuances that come up regarding these issues and intersections, specifically around gender and race and gender and class. Um, I just want to, again, thank you all for taking time. I did not get to prepare written testimony for you all, um, but I am here with other folks from the Sylvia Rivera Law Project who are really deeply committed. Our agency has been very deeply committed to this issue for many, many years. And I just want to reiterate, um, or I guess bring up our concerns around binary systems within the city. For example, the criminal justice system, if someone is arrested, and the shelter system, if someone goes into a city shelter where there are still only the options to enter into a male or female intake shelter, or likewise, when arrested, you are told to enter a male or female designated cell. Um, so I just hope that you all will think about our communities at our intersections, and please look to the Sylvia Rare Law Project and other folks in our communities uh, as you implement this. Thank you so much, Sasha. You definitely do not need notes for public speaking. That was spot on perfect. Um, if you should decide you want to submit written testimony, you can actually do that after the hearing. It's definitely not necessary. Um, but. As we mentioned earlier, communicating this to people who could benefit and answering their questions has to be a part of this, this policy initiative. And we want to make sure that you get the materials you need and the support you need to do that since you're on the front lines. Um, and we'll make sure that our office and, and the City Council continues to interface with the Sylvia Rivera Project for, for that purpose. Thank you very much, Sasha. Thank you. Okay. Last but definitely not least, please. You like? Yep. Hi, my name is Christina Powell. I'm 17 years old and my gender pronouns are she, her, and hers. Today I represent the Young Women Advisory Council at Girls for Gender Equity. We are part of the Young Women Initiative, YWY, that was launched by Speaker Melissa Mark Revito and the New York City Council to identify the gaps in services for young women ages 12 through 24 with a focus on cis and trans women of color and gender non-conforming youth of color. As an anti-violence and education organization, Girls for Gender Equity is committed through our programming and advocacy. We are committed to the physical, physiological, social, and economic development of girls and women. I support the legislation 0954 because of the impact that it will have on transgender and gender non-conforming youth of color. I believe that it's unfair that there is a difficulty for trans and gender non-conforming people of color to live in society and not be accepted for their identities. 
For an example, society wants you to identify yourself as a male or female, forcing many people to categorize themselves with a gender identity that does not represent them. I believe that people should have the right and society should accept individuals to identify as X on their birth certificates to signify a gender that is not exclusively male or female. A 14-year-old member of the Young Women Advisory Council who is non-binary and experienced transphobia and gender dysphoria daily shared that they will love a law like this. Explaining, if society accepted non-binary people like me in legal documents like birth certificates, non-binary people would be recognized. We need a bill like this to spread greater awareness and affirmation. Having your gender recognized and respecting is a human right, and non-binary people are humans. So therefore, we need to be recognized and respected. Youth are at that age or time of our lives where we're trying to figure out ourselves and need the tools, laws, and resources to feel affirmed for our identities. For example, we're figuring out our orientation and gender identity. Am I female? Am I a male? As I assist in the female, it is important for me to advocate for this legislation because cisgender people don't feel worried or is not discriminated about their birth certificates or, un or other documentation that they possess. Whereas transgender and gender non-conforming people often experience gender-based violence and harassment. I urge the council to listen and hear the requests for being made today by trans and gender non-conforming people, advocates, and organizations. I thank the New York City Council for working with the Young Women Advisory Council, and we respectfully request the passing of proposed 094. Thank you, Christina. Did you say you were, how old were you, 17? 17. Okay, very, very, very impressive. Um, thank you for being here. At what, what a great thing that we could close with uh, the voice of a young leader uh, in this movement. Um, this was an incredible, incredible hearing. I cannot thank all of you enough for speaking out and your eloquence. Um, the video should be available by tomorrow, hopefully by tomorrow morning. The transcript should be available, we hope, within the week. We're going to do everything we can to make sure that uh, this is widely disseminated because of the power of your voices, and I think you have uh, collectively given great momentum to this bill, which ultimately will bring about a very important change in the lives of, of so many New Yorkers. So thank you very much, and this concludes our hearing.